Okay, welcome to the final part, part nine of lecture three of Bluff Body Aerodynamics, lecture three. So now I just want to demonstrate the CFD workflow that we've uh, worked through today on a simple sim scale test case. This is going to be really simplified, so we're going to be able to get an answer within a few minutes, but it will capture the various aspects of the workflow. So it's going to be a two-dimensional simulation of a flow over kind of a generic looking bluff body uh, that you see here. So I'll switch over now to SimScale and we'll work through this. Okay, so here's uh, SimScale. Um, what I've done so far is just import the geometry. I had an STL file, which is a surface triangulation of my body shape. Um, I have sort of an extruded section here. Um, it's just a few centimeters long um, and uh, somewhat thicker. Uh, and I'm going to do basically a 2D simulation here. So I'm going to click this create simulation button. But before I do that, we're going to have a quick look at the bounding box of the geometry because we're going to need to create um, the computational domain around this object. So in the x direction, which is this direction, um, Actually, the, the, the bounding box limits are more useful. Um, the box minimum, actually the bounding box limit in the x direction, this gives us the, um, our sort of characteristic length scale, 6.2 um, centimeters. In if we look at our z, uh, z direction, or which is the direction sort of out of the page here, um, the minimum Z is 0 and the maximum Z is 0.2. Um, so we're going to need to make sure that our computational domain falls within that. And in terms of Y value, it's uh, the minimum Y is 0 uh, and the maximum Y is uh, 2.8 centimeters. Okay, so we'll create a simulation. We're going to do an incompressible flow simulation. So we'll do that. And the first thing we have to do is specify the turbulence model. As discussed today, we're going to use the k-epsilon model. We'll do a steady state simulation. We've got our geometry. But we're going to need to create an enclosure before we do this. So, Because right now, it would just simulate the flow inside of this object, which is not what we want. So. The better way to do this is to actually go ahead and we're going to we're actually going to go ahead and delete this simulation and we're going to do something else first with the geometry. We're going to create add a geometry operation and we're going to create an enclosure. So now we see this box which represents the enclosure around our objects. And we can just change uh, this, the shape and size of this. We don't need a seed face. So the minimum uh, x coordinate, uh, we want to make this, uh, let's say, uh, to be on the safe side, let's go five lengths upstream of our uh, leading edge. Um, so the length was something like around six. I mean, so this would be, be negative 0.3 meters. And we can see that that's moved a good distance upstream now. And then downstream, we want to maybe again be five at least. Uh, so if the x coordinates is zero, so we want to actually be six of the body length downstream. So this is going to be about uh, 0.36, roughly. Uh, in terms of z, uh, we can go from zero to, we can make this very thin, 0 0.005, perhaps. Maybe that's a bit too thin. We can go one centimeter thick. One thing that's important to realize is that essentially the thickness we define here, while unimportant for the solution, is going to essentially dis determine the thickest cell that we can have in, 2D, in, a, in a simple 2D simulation like this. Um, so that's probably fine. 
Uh, and then in the y direction, uh, if we're going to want to make this be a simulation sort of near a road, we want to want this to be uh, something very small. That looks good, maybe one centimeter below. And then the maximum y um, will be again something like um, 0.35. There we go. So we can see that our we completely intersect this object and now we'll create the enclosure. This will take just a moment and then we'll see uh, what we actually end up with where the, uh, the, the domain on which the flow will be solved. Then we'll create our simulation again. You see down here it says that it's running. This might take a minute or so. There we go, that's some rapid progress. Some of the later steps that may take a little bit more time, I will uh, sort of fast forward in the video, um, but this takes a brief enough time that I'm just going to let it go. There we go, that's completed. And now we see our computational domain, which is the volume where we want the flow to be solved. Alright, so now we see that, and there's basically a hole where our solid object is, and that's what we want. Now we can create our simulation in compressible flow. Okay, epsilon turbulence model. We've got our geometry set up. We have to select a material, it's going to be air. The initial conditions, this basically determines the initial guess of the solution. In incompressible flow, the absolute value of the static pressure is in, in not important, so we can just set it to be a zero gauge pressure. The velocity now, we have to, so the direction of the velocity, if we want the flow to come from left to right here, the velocity needs to be in the positive x direction, and let's make it, um, say, 10 meters a second. The default values for the turbulence kinetic energy and dissipation rate are automatically calculated and we don't need to worry about them. The next thing we need to do is create boundary conditions. So we'll need a velocity inlet. We have to pick the face on which this applies. That's this one. Velocity inlet, fixed value, 10 meters a second. Then we create another boundary condition, a pressure outlet. We'll say at the outlet of our domain, the static pressure must be zero. Now, we can create a solid wall for the bottom here. Now we have to decide if we want uh, a no-slip wall, which is basically if the wall is stationary, or a moving wall, which would represent um, basically this moving along with the vehicle. Let's do that. Let's set this to also be 10 meters a second. And now this is basically like a road moving underneath this little object. Because we're doing a 2D simulation, we have to create empty 2D boundaries, and those will be these big side faces where we basically don't want anything to happen. And then finally, we need to do something with the top. This is the least obvious one. We have a few options here, but probably the best choice is to make it a wall boundary with a slip wall. This means that flow can't go in or out from here, but there's no shear stress along that surface. Since it's very far away from our object, that's a reasonable choice. Now we've set up all our boundary conditions. Under the advanced uh, concepts, we can look at numerics um, and simulation control. The numerics, we generally are not going to need to make any changes to how this is done, um, but we can see uh, the controls on the residuals, and we could edit, for example, the uh, under relaxation factors if we needed to. Simulation control is important. This is going to tell us the maximum number of steps. It's confusing because it talks about n time and the delta time, but this is a steady calculation, so this generally actually just refers to the iterations. And one second, or one uh, is just the integer number of iterations. So this is saying it'll run for up to a thousand iterations, which is fine. Um, we can say yes, it'll write at the end of that or when it's finished. The number of processors that will be used can be is going to be determined automatically. 
Um, that'll be based on the size of the calculation. The maximum runtime here is 10,000 seconds, so about three hours. It's going to take a lot less than that. This is a nice parameter um, that can save a lot of time. Um, you can do a potential flow initialization. Um, this basically uses a potential flow field to estimate the, the flow field at the beginning. Um, we're not going to need to use this today, but we will use this later in the course. And then this is the details of how the flow field will be decomposed uh, in parallel, and we don't need to ever worry about changing that. Under results control, we want to do a couple of things. Forces and moments. Let's look at force and moment coefficients. We want to get a drag coefficient. So we don't care about rotation because we're not interested in moment coefficients, but we need to specify our lift and drag directions. In our case, the lift would be in the y direction, and the drag is in the x direction. Our reference velocity is 10 meters a second. Our reference length, which was the length of our object, I'm going to just roughly approximate it here since this is just a demonstration. This was about 6 centimeters. Um, actually, sorry, this actually won't be used because this would be used for uh, area uh, moment coefficients only. The reference area is the frontal area. This is going to be the height, and that was, I think, about 2.8 centimeters times this thickness, right? And the thickness was 1 centimeter. So 0 0.01 times 0 0.028. There's our reference area. And now we have to assign faces, and so we'll pick that internal face there. Ah, that makes me realize we forgot something important in the boundary condition setup. We have to add a boundary condition, which is going to be a no-slip wall for the actual surface of our body. We can do some other things, too. We can add additional fields to calculate. We could tell it to calculate the total pressure field and perhaps also the Y plus field. If we go to the mesh, we can look at what's going to be involved here. We're going to use the hex dominant only CFD approach, that snappy hex mesh that I talked about earlier. The meshing mode will be internal because it means it's inside this domain. We can do manual. Uh, mesh sizing automatic. Generally speaking, we'll do manual in this course. We'll set our maximum edge length to be one centimeter, which was our thickness of our domain, and the minimum edge length to be uh, maybe one one hundredth of the length of our body. So, given that it's about six centimeters long, zero point six millimeters would be a good minimum length. We're going to do automatic boundary layers for now. And we won't add any special mesh refinements. We can now generate the grid. It's going to warn me that if I choose to generate the mesh, the current simulation setup will be taken into account for the mesh generation and the mesh will not be adapted for changes to the simulation unless we make a new one. That's fine. Let's generate this mesh. So now we're going to do the first step, which is the mesh generation. And this, again, is started. We can also see that it's in progress here. If we click here... Um, oh, no, sorry. That's not going to bring it up yet. Um, you'll see that it's queued, right? So we're running on a cloud-based computing system here. So the calculations that you request may not run immediately, but these are very small calculations and uh, we shouldn't be queuing for much time at all. There we go, it's running. And once this is really going, here it may be so fast we may not be able to actually sort of see what happens, but um, we will get some extra information that we could bring up here. Uh, if we, we wanted to sort of see that process and get a little bit more information about the process. We can basically get a text window in here that uh, reports on what the mesh generation process is doing. After the mesh is generated, since everything else is already set, we'll be able to immediately begin our simulation run.
So we'll skip ahead now to when the mesh has finished generating. Okay, so welcome back. It's been about 10 minutes and the mesh has finished generating. The mesh has 417,000 cells uh, and we can see it's actually a, a very fine mesh, um, probably far in excess of what's needed, but it's still a small problem, so it won't take long. And we see that what has happened is that there's been sort of a base cell size and the cells have been sort of cut down smaller and smaller um, to resolve the shape of the object and the boundary layer cells have been inserted near the surfaces. So now we can do the final step, which is to run the simulation. We're getting a warning now about empty boundaries um, for a 2D simulation. That's okay, we have a 2D simulation, so it's all good. We'll go ahead and the estimated duration is on the order of an hour and uh, we'll see how this works. So again, this is gonna start um, and it's gonna take some time to kind of get going. It may queue for a bit and then the calculation will run uh, and we'll get some results. So again, I'll come back, uh, we'll skip ahead to when uh, the simulation is, is running, um, then we'll get a little bit of a look at what's happening during the run process, and then we'll skip ahead again to when we've got a converged solution. Okay, now the solution's underway, it's running, and we can see we've got a few more things that we have access to here. So first let's look at this solver log. This is actually the raw output from the solver as the uh, time steps proceed. And uh, it's just sort of showing us that things are moving, working okay. Um, the convergence plot is a very important one. This is gonna sort of show us the residuals that we talked about in the lecture. So we see a residual for the X velocity, the Y velocity, the pressure field, the turbulence kinetic energy field, and the turbulence eddy dissipation rate. An important note about the interface system scale is I can click on any of these pictures or any of these curves to uh, make it appear or disappear from the plot. We're only a few iterations into this calculation, so the residuals haven't dropped much, but so far everything is behaving all right. And we can see that things are starting to drop. More useful is this force convergent plot. We have this force and moments coefficients that we define, and we can watch these um, as they evolve in the simulation. Um, here it can be a little difficult to read this one because the initial values in the first few iterations of these coefficients can vary so much, but they're gradually starting to settle down. The one that we're primarily interested in here is the drag coefficient, so I'm going to turn off all the other curves. And now I can just mouse over and you see this is still changing significantly from 0 0.59, 0 0.53, 0 0.46, but already the drag coefficient is somewhat settling down to being something in the range of 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, um, and this will further settle as the calculation advances. So we'll come back again when the calculation is completed. So now here we are and the calculation is finished. We can see it took 50 minutes, so just under an hour. If we have a look at the convergence plot, what we can see is that really we probably should have let this calculation run a little bit longer because the residuals, especially that of the pressure equation, haven't really dropped by that many orders of magnitude from where they began. Uh, the x velocity and the other equations are probably okay, but the y velocity and pressure equations are still working not super great. But they're clearly on the right trend, um, and for the purposes of this demonstration, that's going to be good enough. If we look at the force and moment coefficient plot, again, I'll turn off the moment coefficient and the other curves that we don't care about. Or just at the lift and drag coefficient. Let's start with the lift coefficient. We don't really care about the lift coefficient, but its value settling down to something constant is a good indicator that the pressure field, which dominates the lift effects, has settled down. And we see that in the last few hundred iterations, um, the lift coefficient seems to just be varying between about 0.29 and 0.31. If we look at the drag coefficient, we see that it's also settled down pretty well to something in the vicinity of 0 0.73 to 0 0.74 uh, based on 
to the reference area I provided. So this is a reasonably converged solution and let's do the final step and look at some of the uh, post-processing we might do. So if we go to solution fields, it's going to take a moment to open and then we have another 3D viewer. This is just a 2D full field we're dealing with here, we don't need to worry about that. And we have a few ways we can look at the results. We can just click results here for, for today's purpose, I'll sort of keep it as simple as possible. And let's look at some scalar quantities. For everything here, there'll be a field and there'll be node values. Typically, you want to look at the node values because these will more usefully um, give you information about the, uh, or so th th these will sort of smooth out the, the flow field. Um, let's actually start by looking at the Y plus value. And if we look at the Y plus, this is really only going to be meaningfully defined on the body surface and on this road surface. What we can see is our Y plus is very small everywhere. Our Y plus is below 5 everywhere. In this case, this was a low Reynolds number simulation, so, so this wasn't all that difficult to achieve. Um, but certainly, the boundary layer uh, first cell sizes here are, are, are absolutely adequate um, when we look at those kinds of Y plus values. Now we can look instead, perhaps, at the pressure field. And this looks about what, how I, we would expect it to look. We see the maximum pressure at the stagnation point at the leading edge, and then the lowest pressure where the flow is accelerated dramatically around uh, the body as well as in the underbody region. We can look at the velocities as well. All velocity is the velocity magnitude. And now we see the velocities in meters per second. And again, of course, we see the zero velocity at the leading edge, and we see a massive separation, which uh, shows us that, uh, that we have this very large low velocity region back here. Right? So this is a large flow separation, which isn't surprising given the uh, slope here and the fact that we're dealing with essentially a pretty much a laminar flow because of the uh, low Reynolds number. One thing that's a bit curious here is that the velocity is not completely uniform along the top, although I think this is just kind of, you see it, it looks more distinct because of the finite number of colors and there's not a lot of variation. Uh, lastly, Let's look at the total pressure. This ought to be uniform pretty much everywhere except at the values where, or, or at the points where there's losses in the flow. And this is interesting. What we can see is that there's actually regions where the total pressure seems to have increased. There is a rise in total pressure associated with the flow on the floor here. That's maybe okay. But these regions suggest that this is some non physical behavior that uh, would probably go away if the calculation ran for a little bit longer. But again, we see the low total pressure or stagnation pressure in the wake, which is what we would expect. So this is a, you know, not completely converged, but uh, reasonable looking result um, that just illustrates uh, the idea of how you do post-processing of a simulation. So now returning to the key messages for today, um, CFD complements wind tunnel testing. Uh, wind tunnel data is the most accurate, but CFD can provide much more information about the flow field. Turbulence models enable us to solve uh, the problems in practical time frames, but they require great care in setting up grids. And the CFD workflow generally involves grid generation, setting boundary conditions, computing the solution, and extracting the desired output.